to save my soul. He came to make a world of sinners whole. So if you were searching for a Savior too, remember Jesus gave himself for you. How many times you've heard the saying, I'd never live in California. I wouldn't want to live out there with all those earthquakes. You know, forget the, the fruits and nuts and the flakes. Uh, I wouldn't want to live around with all the, the earthquakes going on. And maybe several weeks ago, it was reconfirmed in your thinking when you heard about the earthquake that uh, took place over in the Philippines. Over 800 people died almost instantly because of an earthquake and because people are living on the fault line. And just several weeks before that, there was a terrible earthquake over in Iran. Fifty-something thousand people killed in a matter of just a, a few hours. Again, individuals living on the fault line. And the truth is, there are millions of people living on fault lines all over America. The largest fault line and the most dangerous one is not in California. It's not on the West Coast. It is somewhere outside the city of, of Memphis, Tennessee. And if we go across the, the Great Pond and we go overseas, there are fault lines everywhere, nearly every country. Millions of people are in danger, and yet millions of people are so unprepared for the advent of, of an earthquake. But there's other earthquakes that we really need to be concerned about. There was the tremor on the fault line in the financial markets in 1987 when the stock market plunged over 500 points in just a matter of three and one half hours. Tens of thousands of people lost their jobs. Brokers uh, went out of business overnight. Individuals with, with a very safe uh, uh, net work found themselves in, in, in deep financial trouble, trouble almost immediately. And then there was a tremor on the political um, fault line when we, we discovered there was an SNL scandal. It promises to be the biggest financial disaster ever to face the United States in the 20th century, even more prodigious than the Great Fall of 1929. The truth is, all of us live on some fault line which is able to produce some crash. Let me repeat that because I think it's important. The truth is, all of us live on some fault line which is able to produce a crash. And although I do not know you personally today, except for Clyde and Vista and Pam and Mike and Sean, I know her now pretty well, we all have different fault lines that we're living on. Some of you are living on, on financial fault lines, very closely living to the edge. Some of you are, are, are living on relational fault lines. Maybe the marriage is, is strained more than it's ever been before. Maybe it's with a son, or maybe it's with a daughter. Maybe it's with an employer. Maybe it's with a neighbor, but, but it's really shaky for you in this situation. Maybe some of you are living on a physical fault line. Maybe the doctor gave you some bad news last week. Maybe you've been living in an inner pain over the past three or four months or maybe three or four years because the, the doctor has said you are in a situation that cannot be reversed. It can only become worse for you as time passes on. All of us live on some kind of fault line, relational, financial, social, physical, emotional, and yes, spiritual fault lines. All of us are right there living very close to the edge. I like what this, this author wrote in his first book, M. Scott Peck. He said, life is, is very difficult. Life is, is often very sad. Life is replete with disappointments. And life, for most of us, has many crashes. And if one is not equipped for proper thinking in the wake of crashes, one will never grow, and, and one will never stabilize, and, and one is likely to explode into a million pieces because he is not prepared for the crashes 
which are more normal in life than anyone really realizes. And I am convinced today, as we begin this series of lessons, that there are far more crashes that we have to face and far more crashes that we're going to have to pull ourselves together through than we ever really dare to admit in our lives. It was Job the patriarch who would say these words in Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Man born of woman is a few days and is full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and he withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. I want to tell you today that the Bible, the Word of God, has a lot to say to you and me about fault line living. That the Bible is, is filled with stories about men and women who, who live very close to fault lines. And from time to time experience tremors. And from time to time experience in their own lives complete disasters. Not only Job the patriarch, but many men and women, Old and New Testament alike. And I believe the Bible tells us these stories so that you and I might be able to be better equipped for when those times when there's a 7.2 on the Richter scale in our individual life, our personal life, when the business goes bad, when the health turns completely around, when our family seems to not only leave the nest, but emotionally the support is, is no longer there. That the Bible is trying to equip us and, and to make us more realistic about life but there is fault line living, and we must be very, very prepared. Psalm 63 is, is such a story. Psalm 63 is a story about a man who was living on a fault line. The man was, was David. And David experienced many crashes in his life. And Psalm 63 he happened to have a pen and a piece of paper to jot down some of the feelings he had about a particular crash that he was going through in his life. I'm so thankful that the Bible records the heartbreaks of men and women like David the king. I'm so thankful that I am not all alone in, in some of the feelings that I have had in my own personal life when there has been a crash of, of one kind or another. But the Bible has already had a man or a woman who has been there, who has felt that, who has tried to put the pieces together back in his or her own life. Today we're going to be studying together the Word of God in Psalm 63, and we're going to be listening to the Spirit of God as He, as he gives us instruction about fault line living and how we ought to respond. But first, let's just take a, a sidestep here for a moment and talk about earthquakes and tremors and talk about the fault line experiences that went on in David's life long before Psalm 63 took place. I'm convinced as I read the, the life of, of King David that he was a man that liked to live very close to the edge of life. There is something about an individual who has an experience where he comes you know, face to face with a bear. On another occasion, face to face with, with, a, with a lion. And one who, who did battle with these, these creatures, these wild beasts, and, and was able to succumb them and, and spare his own life. Here is a man who, who enjoyed in many ways living close to the fault line. He did not run away from the scary event. He was unashamed to say that my life may be in danger what was it about the lines of, it, of David that he would not only confront a bear and not only confront a lion, but he was the one who would, would stand up in the midst of a bunch of cowards and, and go face to face with this great man called Goliath, the Philistine, champion of the unbelieving people. It was a fault line. There was a tremor all throughout Israel. But David stood right up. And he took his place, and he said, let the earth quake. I will stand my place. And then a few years later, as David becomes a national hero, and as he, as he begins to build up his popularity in the land, there, there was a king on the throne by the name of Saul. 
And Saul was, was very jealous of David, and, and Saul knew that somehow he was capturing the hearts of men and women all over the kingdom of God, and, and Saul tried to kill David, and once again there was a tremor out in the fault line, and this time it was not a lion or a bear or an ugly giant that was from some ugly camp outside of Israel. It was from within the political framework of Israel. And the king did all that he could do with his armies and, and with his manipulated powers to try to somehow kill this man, David. And scholars say that this went on for over two years, David running and hiding in and outside caves all over the place, trying to spare his life. There was a tremor throughout the land, but somehow David survived. And then David becomes the king of Israel in his popular kingdom. I believe he was a popular king because he was an honest king. He never tried to hide his sins, never tried to be more than what he really appeared to be. And he began to conquer that which Saul could not conquer. Here was a man who, who loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, and, and mind, and there were tremendous victories, and there were blessings. And, and to this day, when you talk about Israelites, the name David is more precious to them than any other name in all of their ancestries. Here was a man who had sin in his life, but here was a man who had the guts to live on the fault line and not wink or wince once. David becomes the king, and David gets into the midlife crisis. All the battles are behind him. He has conquered everything there is in sight. The GNP is, is higher than it's ever been. The, the church treasury, you know, never had so much money before. I mean, they can pay the preacher, you know, better than anybody else in the land downtown Jerusalem. And he has his eye on this, this lady called Bathsheba, living close to the fault line. Another tremor in his life. And even though this would scar him more than, than Saul and scar him than more than, than Goliath and, and scar him more than a wild bear or a wild lion in his life, David somehow survived. Again, he lived close to the fall line. And then that brings us up to Psalm 63. Psalm 63 today. Before we get to that yet, we need to look at the background. And in order to look at the background, we've got to go back all the way to 2 Samuel. Before we can understand what Psalm 63 is all about, we've got to go back to 2 Samuel. And really, chapters 14, 15, and 16, we need to read all of those, but time does not permit us to do it. So let's look at a few passages. That's on page 362. If you have the correct Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 15 and beginning at verse number 10. Listen to these words concerning the background of Psalms 63. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel. You know, he had a son, David did, named Absalom. David was a very popular man, but somehow he had one son that didn't like him. He says, I know how the old man really is. He says, I can't stomach the fact that everybody loves him in the land. I live with this guy. I eat breakfast with him. I, I hear what he says when nobody else is around. I know how the guy is. I know how, how wicked this man is, and, and he's not all that hot. And so Absalom had it in his heart that not only did he want to destroy his dad, he wanted him removed from the throne. And Absalom believed that he deserved to be on the throne more than his father. His father was, was a wicked man. And so he begins to put the conspiracy together. And let's look at these words again. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is the king in Hebrew. And 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. And they had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. And whilst Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel to Gilnite, and David's counselor to come from Gil, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. Verse 13. A messenger came and told David, and the hearts of, of the men of Israel are, are with Absalom. And David said to all his officials who were with him in, in Jerusalem, Come, let's, let's load up the U-Haul trucks. Let, let's flee. 
None of us will escape from Absalom. He understood his son. He realized how, how ruthless he really was. He, he realized he would not stop at anything to get what was in his heart. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and, and bring ruin upon us and, and put the city to the sword. I believe that this is one of the saddest passages in all the Old Testament. Here's David. And a pitiful sight, trying to round up all of his men and, and several of his, of his precious things and to leave the very city that he built. I wonder today in America how many parents have to leave their homes because of their children. I wonder today how many parents have had to mortgage and, and refinance and, and destroy their, their financial empires and, and the security and, and the net that they have of peace all because there's a rebellious son or, or a rebellious daughter. I want to tell you that the Bible today is the most contemporary book that you can buy anywhere in any bookstore. The story of David is the story of America today. David's heart was broken because of a, of a rebel son. And I want to tell you today that that story is repeated over and over again, even in Christian families throughout the kingdom of God. And then over in, in chapter 16 and beginning in verse number 5, if uh, it wasn't really all that bad, we're going to have some injury added to insult here. Listen to what happens. David's leaving. He's going down the road with his entourage. And as King David approached uh, Baharam, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. And his name was Shema, the son of Ger. And as he cursed, and he cursed as he came out. And he fell to David and all the king's officials with stones, uh, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's left and on his right. And as he cursed, Shimei says, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you, you scoundrel. You see what's happening here? David is leaving in shame. Not leaving because of the Philistines, not leaving because of the Amorites and the Moabites or any otherites. He's leaving because of one rebellious son. And here is Shimei. He sees the, what is happening. He sees this entourage coming down the road. And, and much in the spirit of Billy Martin, you know, as he would kick the dust at the, at the umpire at home plate. Shimei begins to pick up rocks and, and to throw dirt and, and to pelt the king. And, and he is cursing the king. And, and he says, you're bloodthirsty and, and you deserve what you're getting. You are a scoundrel. You're not king. And how does David respond to this? How does he say this? Verse 10, but the king says, What do you and I have in common, you sons of Zerai? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, Curse David, who can ask, Why do you do this? And David then said to Abishai and all his officials, My son, who is, who is of my own flesh, is, is trying to take my life. How much more than this Benjamin? Leave him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him to. And it may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I am receiving today. And, and so as David and his men continued along the road while, while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went and, and throwing stones at him and, and showering him with dirt. It wasn't just at one scene here. But all along the hillside, here comes Shimei, throwing the insults and the dirt and the stones. And, and David had the power to, to cut his head off. But David said, let him do it. We probably deserve to have this happen. And then the key verse, verse number 14. Time passes. And it says, the king and all the people with him arrive at their destination. Exhausted. Exhausted. And there he refreshed himself. Many scholars believe when David refreshed himself, he wrote the words of Psalm 63. How many of you, when you're exhausted, how many of you, when you're depressed, at that tremor in your life, are able to sit down and then write a song? Let's look at the words of Psalm 63. How does a believer respond to a quake? Listen to what David writes in the very first word. 
Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David turned inward to his soul. David turned inward to his soul. That is how a believer responds to a quake. That is how a believer responds to a crisis in his or her own life. David turned inward to his soul. And I tell you today, he did it because he was comfortable turning inward to his own soul. I don't know you people very well. I, I'm a guest in your midst today. I know the Hepburns very well. But as I look out in the assembly today, and I have heard some of you heard Trent lead a prayer earlier, and I see the cars you drove in, and the way you dress. I mean, you very much you impress me. As a people that love the Lord, and the people who are very confident about yourself, and some of you, I'm sure, are successful businessmen and women. Some of you may be retired, and you have done well and put it aside for, for many, many years. Some of you may be considered some of the most successful people in this community. I, I, I don't know. But let me ask you something today. How do you respond to a quake in your life? David didn't turn to his advisors. He had a lot of them. David didn't go out and take a poll to see if maybe it was okay for him to go back to Jerusalem. David didn't attend a seminar on, on Quakeology 101A, how to respond to quakes when they happen in, in your own individual life. David turned inward to his soul. Now there's a principle we need to understand in that. We cannot turn inward to our souls in the bad times and somehow hope to reap some kind of blessing in our life if we have not been turning inward to our souls in the good times. Let me say it again. How many times is it we get into trouble and we decide to think about spiritual things and, and we want to enlarge the walls of our heart and somehow be receptive to God Almighty when things are bad. It will not work in the bad times if there has not been quality devotional times in the good times. And the practice is simply this. We must discipline ourselves in the good days. When the sun is shining and the bills can be paid and the kids are under control and things are well for us physically, we must discipline ourselves in those days so that when there is a 7.2 on the Richter scale, when the phone rings in the midst of the night, when there's a knock at the door that you did not anticipate, when the bank statement comes or the stockbroker calls, we will survive. And David was a great man of God, not because he overcame all of his vices, he did not. Not because he simply put everything together in his, his spiritual life and, and because he knew all the Bible and, and he wrote the words of Psalms 119 and, and Lord, you know, I'm going to hide these things in my heart that I may not sin against you. David was a good man because in the good times he remembered the Lord. David turned inward to his soul. Let's look at the rest of the psalm. And let's look at the road work on the road to recovery, verses 2 through 8. First of all, verses 2 to 5, and write in your outline there the word sanctuary. David realized some principles on the road to recovery. Some things that had to be evident in his life, and his life was going to be a blessing to him in a time of recovery when there is, there is earthquake. He says, I have seen you in the sanctuary. He's talking to God. And, and I have beheld your power and your glory. And, and because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. And, and my soul will be satisfied as with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my, my mouth will praise you. David's not in Jerusalem when he writes. David's somewhere in the desert of, of, of Judah. David is, is on the run. The U-Haul is parked outside the cave, and, and they, not, they really don't know where they're going to go next. They've got to kind of watch the battle movements and of, of, of the enemy, the son Absalom. 
But David here immediately begins to praise God and, and immediately comes up with this principle of sanctuary. The real sanctuary is, is miles away back in Jerusalem. But David, being a great man of God that he was, realized from the very beginning of his spiritual life, sanctuary has nothing to do with place. Sanctuary has something to do with attitude. Amen. And here is David on the run in his life, not knowing if the Lord is going to pull him out of the fire this time knowing that he may never go back and see the city he built with his own hands. But he is able in his heart, he is able to enlarge his soul, and he is able in his attitude to see the majesty and to see the power and to see the love of God. And some of us here today are so busy building our Jerusalems, our businesses, our return on our investment, that we are not spending quality time enlarging the walls of our soul and, and really having the sanctuary to see the majesty, the power, and the love of God that will bring us through when the earth begins to tremble. But David can see it. David sees not his problem. He sees the sanctuary. And then verse number six. Write down the word sleep. There he is. He's on the run. He says, on my bed. He says, I remember you. And I think of you through the watches of the night. He can't sleep. The watches of the night. Several times during the night, David's there. He looks at his alarm clock. Yes, Lord, I'm still awake. And I'm not sleeping because I'm afraid. I'm not sleeping because I'm troubled. We've been there, all of us. But David says a key word there is he remembers. He remembers. Maybe David could remember the time when he was flirting with death of the bear and the lion. And maybe he remembered the time that he stood before Goliath when all the cowards stayed in their ditches. And maybe he remembered the time that he survived over and over again because of the sword of, of Saul, the king, the wicked one, the anointed one of God. Maybe you remember the time when the forgiveness of the Lord was there when he committed adultery and he'd been murdered. All in the episode, the soap opera of Bathsheba, he remembered how graceful God was to him in his life. But there was one thing David did. He remembered. He remembered. David was able to focus on a sanctuary. And David was able to focus on a, a memory of, of where God was with him in times past. And then in verse number 7, the word security. He says, because you are my help, I, I see in the shadow of your wings. David probably would have liked to have lived in Montana. He was an outdoors man. He's a shepherd. He writes a lot about the stars. He writes a lot about nature and birds. His reference here is a reference to an eagle. I never saw an eagle out of captivity till Thursday or Friday. It's a beautiful sight to behold. But David here has reference to how the mother eagle would spread her wings over the nest to protect her from predators. And David realized that there was security in his life, not because there was sinlessness, but because there was a merciful father who cared for him in spite of his sins. I remember a time several years ago I was an MC at a, at a lecture ship in Midland, Michigan. And I had gotten up and to close the whole session, the day was going to be over, and, and I confirmed the speakers, and I said amen to some of the things that were being said, and there was a group of people there. I know this is hard for you to believe, but there are vultures in our brotherhood. And they were waiting for me to get off the podium because they didn't want me to, to confirm or affirm these men. They wanted me to denounce them. And they got me in a circle, and they began, they didn't hit me physically, but verbally they were, they were moving in on me. And this one guy, he, he, he was really bad. I mean, he had a big bushy mustache, and he was bald-headed, and he reminded me of Kojak, and I waited any moment for him to give me a karate chop. And they began to move in a little closer to me and telling me that I was, I was a liberal and telling me that I was wrong and, and, and really began to move in on me. And I remember one of my elders, a 
kind of a small man, but he broke the circle and he stood in front of me and he draped his arms around me and he protected me from these individuals. And then basically he said, you take me on. This is my preacher. You mess with him, you mess with me. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I felt so secure standing behind an elder who loved me and really believed in me and believed in my ministry. And David here doesn't think so much in terms of I deserve this as much as he's focusing on the fact I'm secure. And then finally in verse 8, write down the word stability. I, I stay close to you. Your, your right hand upholds me. You see, God has a way to, to touch us after we crash. To stabilize us when we say, man, it's, it's lost. It's gone. I can't bring it back. It will never be the same, Brother Jim. How many times have I heard that over the years as a minister? It will never be the same, Brother Jim. That's the story of this world, brothers and sisters. Whether it's losing a son or a daughter or a business or your health or, or whatever it is, it's never going to be the same physically. That's why it's so important that we feel and experience the right hand of God touching us and stabilizing us when the earth is quaking and we just do not believe that we'll be able to stand anymore. Now, I don't know you people very well, but I do know you've been humiliated. Some of you have lost. That some of you have reaped the rewards of stupidity. I've been there. You've been there. And the only thing that we can do to prepare for further crashes in our lives is to enlarge the walls of our soul so there can be sanctuary and so that there can be sleep and so that there can be security and stability. You can avoid living in California. That's a choice. But you can not avoid living on the fault line. There will be quakes. Let's stand. Our Father, there are Absaloms in our lives today that we're running from. And some of us here, Father, are very frightened. There's been a quake. And then still, Father, an aftershock. We're scared. We ask you today, Father, simply to equip us to enlarge the walls of our souls so that we can find a safe house, a sanctuary. That while the winds will rage, Father, we will still find occasion to praise you. Father, thank you for David and for the faith that he had and the stability, Father, that he experienced. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 and 52 tells us that after Jesus was crucified, the earth quaked. The earth shook. And whether mankind recognized it or not, all of us, all of them, were living on a brand new fault line. How did the people respond? Some of the people began to believe. Some were immersed. Some repented. Some of them went everywhere preaching the word. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the individuals responded much like the people in the world today respond. 
with more unbelief and more resistance in their lives. Brothers and sisters and friends, what's your fault line today? How many are you living on? Do you need a savior? Do you need to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you need the prayers of this church? That we can pray with you and pray for you as you go through this quake and later still the aftershocks. Jesus is the one who saved my soul. He came, he came to make a world of sinners whole. So if you were searching for a savior too, Remember Jesus gave himself for you. Thinking about the wounded heart I could not hide. When I was hurting from the emptiness inside. 